Hello, I am Kate Robb. I am Senior Archaeologist with John Cronin and Associates and I work out of our Bunkrana office here in County Donegal. Um, I suppose I've been delighted to be involved with the St Mirrors project now for a number of years and I'm even more delighted to be able to present um, a flavour of, I suppose, the, the exceptional pride and sense of place and connection that the local community in Fawn have with the St Mira's um, ecclesiastical site and especially the cross slab in this instance. Um, I mean the dedication and activism of, of community groups like this all throughout the country um, without without groups like this who have single-handedly you know driven heritage projects forward have Without them, they, they've been paramount to the success of these sites in terms of their presentation, their interpretation and their conservation. And as a result, the future is ex exceptionally bright and, and it's so positive to see. And as I say, I'm delighted to, to be involved. So um, the passion and the can-do attitude of, of Fawn Heritage Group is um, to be commended in, in every way. And um, I suppose none of this would either be possible without the, the support of the, the funding bodies, um, including the Heritage Council, uh, National Monuments Service, through the Community Monuments Fund, and of course Donegal County Council as well, who are, who are guardians of, of the site. So I've titled this presentation um, Community Collaboration and Resilience. So I guess, first of all, I want to try and give you some insight into the exemplary actions that the community have taken to address the conservation issues at St Mira's and how that has directly translated into really effective um, collaboration with the statutory bodies and the stakeholders involved with the site. And I suppose, finally, what I'd like to do then is, is to outline, I guess, how all of this work has translated into building really tremendous resilience at St Mira's um, and not only that but really exciting opportunities that hopefully could maybe uh, be replicated elsewhere. So first of all though let, let me give you a little um, context I suppose to, to St Mira's and um, the cross slab in itself. St Mira's is located on the eastern shores of Lough Swilly in Fawn, in Fawn village in County Donegal and it's part of an overall uh, early medieval ecclesiastical site founded by St Mira at the at the beginning of the 7th century. So there's church ruins there and um, an enclosure uh, possibly identified through the road network as well as you know carved uh, stone fragments. Now, St Mira himself um, has, uh, was a descendant of Owen, son of Nile, of the Nine Hostages, and uh, was considered the patron saint of the O'Neill, who of course have the seat in Greenan of Alia, which is, you know, only six or seven kilometres to, to the south there. And there's also a crozier and a bell shrine um, connected of, of, of St Mira's, and the, the bell shrine is, is currently housed in the Walls Collection in London. Now the cross slab itself is it's over two meters high and it's over a meter wide and this um, slab type form of, of depiction of crosses onto a stone is said to be the precursor and, and the starting point essentially of, of the beginning of the High Cross series. So you can see there that there's a projection of a very short arms and this is, is said to be the, the beginnings of the, the freestanding carved cross um, that we see very much in the 10th century. So clearly, given the, the exquisite art on, on the face of St Mira's Cross Slab, it has been the subject of much antiquarian interest. And, um, you know, Wake Manscaped sketched it there in, in the mid-19th century and pioneering uh, women like Francois Henri and Mabel Calhoun and Helen Rowe, they've, they've all written about um, uh, and inter tried to interpret the art form on, on the Cross Slab. So uh, 
just in terms of the art itself, uh, you can see that the, the stone itself is worked into a triangular point at the top. And as I mentioned, there's a projection of the short arms on each side. Um, the cross is its relief. It's in relief, the carving, and it has ribbon tracery that's sort of interlooped and woven and, and knotted in, in terms of uh, an internal sort of Celtic uh, insular art style. What's interesting um, on the west face is that we have the depiction of two monks in profile um, looking inwards, a side profile looking inwards to the cross shaft and um, they have long hair and they're wearing robes and they've been identified as ecclesiastics. Um, there is inscription on, on the robes but has it hasn't been uh, deciphered as of yet due to just the, the sort of poor condition, condition of, of the weathering there. Now the east face also depicts a cross, um, a carved cross in relief. I suppose the difference on this side is that we have the, the boss, uh, four bosses uh, with concentric circles on the inner arms of the cross itself and one in the centre too. And um, also we have a carved pediment at the top that um, it's been interpreted. There's a number of interpretations relating to that by way of uh, depiction of, of birds um, and possibly birds holding the bread of life and, and, and that sort of thing. Now, on the north side of, on the edge of the cross slab as well, uh, there is the Greek inscription um, citing the Gloria, uh, which is, it's said, to, uh, as far as I know, is the only Greek inscription on a stone um, uh, monument in Ireland. And that, that type of script um, dates between the, the 4th and 8th century, which ties into the, the timeline of St. Mira. So, we also have, I suppose, comparable examples and in terms of contemporary uh, sites just 25 kilometres north and in Inishon Peninsula as well in terms of the Donna Cross down in Carn Donna. And um, on both sites, uh, you know, at Carn Donna and St. Mura, you can see that there's there's uh, two very different art forms kind of blending into one, if you like, and it's that depiction of Christianity by way of the cross itself, you know, that dates to the, to the four, 400 AD in Constantine, the time of Constantine. And also, though, what you do have is that um, metaphor of sort of eternity and looping and winding through the ribbon tracery and filled by way of pattern in those crosses. So, so that art style evolved during the 5th and 6th century, 7th centuries, and was practiced right up to, to the 12th century. Now, this is an example of, of where these precursors, that is St. Mura, is how, how they kind of finished up in that high cross series. And, you know, the tall, very tall, freestanding ringed crosses that we know. Um, and there's some nice examples there down at Clonmac Noise, which incidentally has been moved indoors um, to protect it from weathering. And um, also then there's St. Muradix uh, Cross in Monaster Boys and, of course, done a more cross in, in Tyrone. So the community group in Fawn was um, founded in 2005 and soon after the Heritage Council launched the initiative of um, and, and published guidance for community groups to, uh, to maintain and care for uh, the maintenance of, of historic graveyards throughout the country. So that, that no small part was the impetus you could say of um, where, where the work for, with the community group and form where the work really kicked off and um, a lot of work was done back then in terms of tidying up the graveyard in general and ever since that local community has, has been um, invested in the site in a big way and the, the community itself you know they have intimate knowledge of this site and they you know there's a great bunch of people with all sorts of um, skill sets that they're that they're bringing to the table in terms of um, you know farming backgrounds, teaching backgrounds, architectural backgrounds, um, tour guiding backgrounds, artists, it's a whole range of people and it's a real diverse mix that has um, resulted in a, a fantastic plan of action for this site. 
So um, the the group set about in 2018, they got together, they realised that there were some conservation issues and threats at the site. They were concerned about weathering on the cross slab and as well as the stability of, of the church ruins there too. So um, they, they set about uh, engaging in, 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 in seeking specialist opinion and consultation and you know how they were able to access grant funding and um, you know the, the, the ins and outs of, of, of doing that is no small feat so there was great people power in that and the, the, they got grant funding that got approval for um, the stabilisation of, of the church ruins and also the appraisal of um, how to deal with the cross lab and to kind of identify what the issues were and how, how we were going to uh, try and uh, reach solutions around that. So there was great traction in 2018 and it must be said there, there was exemplary um, fundraising initiatives on, on the part of this group. You know, they, they produced a promotional video, they have a very active online presence. Um, they, they had a GoFunded campaign, which was hugely successful, uh, really successful and attracted diaspora and academics and, and people from all over the world, essentially, um, as well as the local community. So, you know, there there was, there was Christmas gift donation uh, initiatives, there was a grand auction in terms of donated collectibles and antiques, there was cash for clobber, for recycled clothing and, uh, you know, a music event, all sorts of really fantastic um, fundraising initiatives. So all the while, um, a plan of action was being developed, which um, set the foundations uh, to, to where we are, to, to move forward to where we are today. The strength and collaboration, um, which has resulted in um, a completely stable church ruin now, uh, was brought about by a group uh, of people, again, with, as I say, with a, a range of skill sets. And Caroline Dixon Architects led that element of the project. And you can see there um, the finished result. But I suppose initially at the outset, there was a volunteered effort on the part of the community group to, to trim back that IV, no mean feat um, at the lower courses of, of the church there to be able to assess and, and uh, work out a, a method statement for, for statutory consent. Local stonemasons did the work there, Seamus Freeland's sons, and did a fantastic job, a very painstakingly um, precise job of removing, raking out. There was massive tree stumps uh, in the corners of, of uh, each gable end. A lot of work was done and um, it's, it's a fantastic end result. So naturally enough, there was a, a celebration and, and an unveiling at the time uh, back in 2019 in terms of uh, uh, finishing out that at that aspect of the project. So all the while, uh, ourselves and John Cronin Associates, we were developing uh, uh, an identification essentially of the issues and threats at the, at the cross slab and what we, we were to do about it. And again, a collaboration with uh, the community group as well as uh, Jason Bolt, Dr. Jason Bolton, a stone decay um, specialist came on board and while consulting engineers, we, we had um, had great discussions with them in terms of the of stability and, and the, the integral stability of, of the cross itself. And I'll talk about that in a while. But again, um, great discussions with, with statutory bodies, national monuments, and, and we tapped into the work of the Discovery Programme had done do, through the, the 3D Icons project a number of years ago, as well as um, working with the Donegal County Council, who say is guardian, here are guardians of the site. Now, I've just done a little time lapse here of um, the condition of the cross slab, uh, just to illustrate to you um, the, the extent of the, the lichen growth on, on the, both faces of, of the cross slab. So you can see there in 2018 that there's heavy colonisation, especially on um, the, the west face, the upper images there uh, on the west face. So in 2018, this is how we, um, this is what we, uh, uh, sort of we're dealing with and incidentally a year later you can see that the stones are quite blackened here and that has been a result of the boxing off that had happened uh, during the church conservation works obviously to, to protect any um, accidental damage to the cross slab during those works but what that what the, the indirect result of that was that it had starved the lichen of um, direct sunlight and it 
had uh, started to die off, uh, essentially. So, uh, you know, very quickly within the year, then you can see there's a massive, a very dramatic difference in terms of um, how the cross is presenting and uh, the visibility of the art form. And, you know, it's amazing just just how much that lichen was actually masking the art and um, and our appreciation of it, essentially, you know, in terms of, of its presentation. A number of other issues and threats were, were identified at, at the Cross Lab Monument as well. And um, the first of those were is, is I suppose, the stability of, of the, the Cross Lab in, much, in so much as there's a very apparent um, eastward tilt to, to it as it stands at the, at the moment. Now, um, clearly within, within a burial ground, you know, there's multiple grave cuts in and around and abutting the base of this Cross Slab. So the ground conditions don't exactly lend themselves uh, to a stable, a stable um, subsurface environment, I suppose, in, in a way. But um, also, there there is spalling at, at the bottom here, at the at, at the side too, which again, um, the center of gravity is, is maybe a little bit compromised in relation to that. Now, um, there's also. There's, there, there's lamination on, on the cross too. Now, the geological form of, of it is such that there's vertical sort of lines or beds in the cross slab and the exposure on the sides there has meant that that's opened up somewhat. And, you know, with um, weather-based stressors in terms of freeze thaw and, and that type of thing, it's, 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 it's potentially leading to a widening of those gaps. And you can see so, some mosses and vegetation are starting to take root in in the deeper grooves um there's also you know this shelf here the the triangular pediment on on the west face of of the slab has has got the same sort of issues going on now there's a fracture on on one of the arms it's you know it's, it's there a long long time but you know this fracture as well has exposed that sort of um uncarved surface if you like now, um, as well as that, the you know, as I mentioned, the, the lichen growth there earlier, that's, that's a big issue uh, in terms of its overall presentation and whether or not um, Jason's investigating at the moment, whether or not that lichen growth is, is having a detrimental effect to, to the carved art itself. Um, uh, but also, you know, there's been a very much increased visitor um, numbers to this site. You know, you've, you have initiatives like the, the Wild Atlantic Way that's, that's, you know, really putting the site on the map but as well as that though um you know locals and and you know na national sort of holiday um staycationers and all the rest you know there there's a lot a lot more visitors to this site and you know people naturally enough are up and in and around the base of the slab and and touching it and and all the rest so i suppose there's there's management issues there um, also, you know, there's gaps in knowledge with this site, uh, as, as as could be said, I suppose, for a lot of sites. But, you know, we we've no, we don't know for sure if this is in its original position. Uh, we don't know what form the cross is taking below the, the, the ground surface in so much as it, we, we don't know how deeply set it is. Is there packing stones? You know, what's that foundation like? And what condition is the unweathered stone um, in below below the ground surface? Now, again, with collaboration and uh, sort of trying trying to drive this forward in terms of best practice, you know, there's there's lots that's that's going on. Um, digital technology is is a huge part of this, and so in that the you know the discovery program have already scanned um, the the cross slab uh, sort of 10, 15 years ago, and there's a great digital archive of data sets there that um, we're hopeful that we can uh, rely upon now in terms of comparative analysis. As well as that, you know, there, there's national policy in relation to how we um, manage these sites in the context of climate change. Now, at the Cross um, Slab site, clearly we have got, you know, wetter, warmer winters and drier, hotter summers. And with that, you know, heavy increased ground saturation and around that burial site, um, is not lending itself well to the stability of, of a big, heavy cross slab. And, um, you know, to be able to monitor how that's performing in the context of our, of our weather is something that, that we're actively undertaking at the moment. 
And as well as that, you know, um, there's comparable projects potentially that hopefully what we're, the work that we're doing at St Mira's can maybe be replicated elsewhere. Uh, as I say, in terms of digital technology as well, there, there's massive opportunity in terms of, of, of how we present these sites and how we interpret it through smart applications. And, you know, there's lovely, as you can see there, an example of a lovely um, glass panel as, as a viewing lens, essentially. And, you know, there's lots of smart things that can be done through the lens of your camera uh, while you're on site, you know, including a guided tour of, of the graveyard potentially, but also, you know, illustrative depictions at scale and in scale form of, of that art potentially even in painted form. Enable uh, for us to be able to scope out what the, the best um, option or preferred option for St Mira's and in, in consultation with the heritage group as well, statutory bodies. We identified that that there's sort of four general um, options that that are applicable to sites of this type. You know, there's a do nothing scenario where essentially, um, you know, we accept that uh, decay is, is is a natural process on a on a finite resource, and you know, it's just how we deal with that in the meantime and how we uh, maximise its presentation for for present day. There's also options around shelter or, or canopy provision. You know, we see that down at Carndonna with the timber canopy or Moon High Cross, for example, that has the, the glazed roof over or, you know, inside in the in the church ruins. And as uh, you've seen the, the uh, economic noise example there inside a purpose built building, you know, and and all the rest. So, so that's that's an option as well. Um, uh, as I say, yeah, that relocation indoors and preservation of it. And I guess the other the other option is the retention of conservation, which is uh, when all things are considered uh, as in, in, the, in the category elements of, I suppose, cost, complexity, um, you know, whether there's there's impact, negative and indirect impact on the on the setting of, of the monument and whether or not it, the option is achieving long term conservation goals that it was determined that retaining the the cross slab outside where it is in its current location in situ and trying to conserve what we have uh, when all things were considered is is has been determined the the most feasible option at this moment in time. Now um, the monitoring that I mentioned there and this just to give you a little little idea of, of what we're doing in, with regard to that. So in October of last year we set up a baseline to, uh, that, that, that captured the condition of the monument for one but also um, the inclination angle of the tilt of, of the cross slab and you know this monitoring program overall is, is such that it's developed in such a way that it can be replicated with with detailed accuracy again and again so that those logs can be um you know uh scientifically um relied upon i guess uh, you'd like, if you'd like to say and also the community have inputs here uh in in terms of the the ever watchful eye that that's always there anyway uh overlooking and protecting this site but also you know logging weather based events you know in, in terms of extreme weather be it heavy rain storms um you know the big freeze that sort of thing is all data that we're intending to capture uh, so that we can um you know make reference to that in, in terms of the performance of the stone in the context of climate change also, ultimately, the findings from that programme will, will enable statutory bodies and stakeholders to, to make informed decisions around this site, um, which will have direct bearing on its long term conservation. And obviously that will facilitate best practice and planning and maybe uh, hopefully it's something that can be replicated at sites elsewhere of, of monuments of this type. So. As I say, a detailed methodology was set up to be able to um, monitor the, the inclination tilt off of the cross slab. And this just gives you a, a brief illustration of how we went about doing that. And really, it was a case of um, setting up static uh, control points there within the, the graveyard itself. So that, that can be tied in and surveyed again um, uh, through GPS, sort of, you know, ground survey, ground surface survey there. And the uh, reliance was essentially made of of rectified photography and um, which was you know work, uh, imported into digital software that ultimately then was carried across into into CAD so that we were able to determine these measurements
measurements and um, and angles. So the baseline has been set up and uh, we're actively monitoring that now at the moment and, and for, for going forward into the future as well. So that's a great result in terms of how we're, we're building um, resilience at this cross slab. So just to recap um, uh, in terms of how we're building and building the resilience at the site and um, yeah, the, the stability has been addressed now for, uh, through the monitoring program. We're actively reassessing at the moment, Jason's very busy reassessing the stone decay um, with, with the lichen removal and what that's telling us now in terms of new information and new data. And um, we're future proofing any informed sort of um, decision making in and around the, the long term conservation needs of the cross slab. There's all their opportunities as well that um, that's really coming to the fore now and it's getting very exciting at this stage of the, of, of the project in terms of how, uh, you know, sourcing the, the, the quarry source for the cross slab and the geological origin and what that's telling us and, and how we can empower the community by way of um, a tool kit to, to seek out that source and uh, bring new story and narrative to the site, which is very exciting altogether. And also I'm delighted to say that the Discovery Programme have gladly come on board for, to, to rescan the cross slab uh, just there in September and uh, uh, they're, they're, the plan is to do it again once the lichen is, is a lot of the lichens removed and so that we have a, a really detailed set of comparative data using new equipment, newer and better equipment and newer and better technologies and uh, how that uh, is, is informing climate, climate driven stressors on, on the site. As well as that, you know, with um, potentially with with like in removal, we're we're having, you know, and, and the use of new technologies in terms of equipment. Um, there's potential there in terms of how uh, the art itself is depicting itself today, and whether there's anything new to learn in that in terms of art history, and uh, inscription detail. So there's great opportunities for enhanced high quality presentation and replication. And again, that's all through collaborative effort and uh, through funding bodies and all the rest. There's really exciting opportunities there. And not only that, you know, all the work that's been done to date and all the work that we plan to do in the next couple of years, I'm hope, very hopeful that this will have direct use um, with colleagues in, in Northern Ireland and Scottish colleagues who, who have stone monuments of, of uh, similar nature and coastal environments. And, you know, hopefully there'll, there'll be great scope to develop actual policy and guidance in relation to how we maintain and uh, conserve these carved valuable stone monuments for the future. So I'll just leave you now with um, a little uh, hot off the press image from Anthony Corns in, in the discovery programme of the latest scan of the cross lab. And you can see the detail there is absolutely fantastic. And we're, we're, we're thrilled um, to, to have this data. So thank you to you all. And um, I hope I hope that's been informative uh, today.